the Bible says grow. Growth is not simply numerically, though it is numerically, but the growth that ultimately God wants from you and I is a spiritual growth. The feeding of the inward man, right, to grow spiritually and to abound, all right? We will get to uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, 18 here in a second, but that is my uh, objective. Actually, I look right there, and I don't have my objective screen up there, so that's my only objective. That's why I didn't put it up there, <laughs> to grow. <laughs> I was going to click the slide, but it tells me what my next slide is right there. All right, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter number 3. We're going to look at this from a couple different angles. I'm going to throw out a couple things and let you know that I've been challenged with and I want to put forth. 2 Peter chapter 3, and I put verse 18. I want to give us a background of this, all right? Peter's aged. Time... From the time that Peter had, remember that Jesus uh, died, we believe, by our current calendars at the age of 33. But if you take him to be born at B.C. Uh, 4 or 6, then you would say he, was, he died around uh, Anno Domini 20, 28, 29, somewhere in there, okay? Anyways, he's 33 years old when he dies, okay? And after he has resurrected, and not too long after that, he ascends, right? Goes back into heaven. Ye men of Israel, why stand ye here gazing? You remember that in Acts chapter 1. But prior to that, he restores Peter. We remember that, right? And he even tells Peter the way in which he's going to glorify him when he was older. When you're old, what's going to happen? You're going to be led away. Your hands are going to be stretched out. All of these things are going to happen to you. And what was Peter's response? Well, what about him? What about this one you love? Who's he talking about? John. Do you remember? I'm referencing John chapter 21, all right? The last uh, chapter or two of the book of John and what happens. And he says, never mind him. You follow me, all right? He, he, and so that's what we're dealing with there. In the process of time, Peter would preach the first gospel sermon. You follow me? On Pentecost, you had people from Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, Pontus, uh, figure of strangers from Rome, Edomites, all these different places. And when you read this letter here, uh, at, when, it, when it starts out in uh, uh, the first epistle, guess who he's addressing? Those same groups of people that he addresses on Pentecost. Uh, uh, he, he, he starts to deal with those in chapter 1. He says, uh, Pontus, Galatians, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the same people that he had been preaching to on Acts 2. You're following me? What's my point? Time has transpired. Peter writes this second letter trying to stir up their minds by way of remembrance, and he wants them to be faithful. Are you following me? And he wants them to grow. He knows that the Lord is going to return, and he knows that he must put off this earthly tabernacle. He mentions this in this letter, okay? And so when you get to chapter 3, he's talking about how this day of the Lord is going to come and how all these things happen and scoffers and these things are going to be exposed. And then in verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent, painstakingly so, all right, to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. And they do, as they do the other scriptures, verse 17. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this. Uh, uh, beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability. You see it? He's encouraging you and I to remain steadfast. Verse 18 tells us, but grow. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity and forever, both now and forever. So the Bible instructs for you and I to grow. I believe growth, when we're talking about it, like the way I'm going to talk about it, is twofold. If you're taking notes, we, we, there's, there's individual growth, and as a result, you will have collective growth. When I say collective, I'm talking about the body. When we come together as a 
congregation and how we are viewed in the community. Does that make sense in our surrounding areas? But when we grow as individuals, I think that will necessarily uh, take care of itself in one facet, in one facet, all right? So let's take a text now talking about growth. Psalm 127, and then we'll look at 1 Timothy 3.15 as a foundation for growth and what must always transpire first. Psalm 127, verse 1. Psalm 127, verse 1. All right. I believe this one is attributed to Solomon, right? Psalm 127, verse 1. Very familiar text to, to most of us when we read it. The psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in what? Vain. All right. Are we talking about a brick and mortar house here? Nay, friends, we're not. So unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go uh, late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Here's, here's the point. The foundation in which we're going to try that, which we're trying to lay and which has been laid for us in the church is the, is, is Christ, the solid rock on which we stand. And if we ever get away from that, then it's all in vain. It's all for naught. No matter how many people uh, our ears are tickled and no matter how many people on the outside speak well, if it's not in accordance with what God has said and ordained, then it is all for naught. I want to show you now that this house that he is talking about is the church. So now we have First Timothy chapter three, verse 15, another very familiar passage. All right. First, Tim, uh, First Timothy chapter three. And let's look at about verse number. Uh, We start at verse 14, all right? So what are we talking about? A foundation upon which we build on and wish to grow. And our foundation for growth and spiritual growth should always be the word of God, not man, not someone else, all right? But the the word of God. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I tarry long or if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave himself in the house of God or the household of God, which is the what? Church of the living God, a pillar and ground or buttress of the truth. So who makes known the truth? Christians, those that are inside his church. And so unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. If we're going to try to build something for God, we have to make sure we're building according to his word. So the church is rooted and grounded in the word of God. And in particular, the apostles doctrine, Acts 2 and 42. Are we following me? Just a bunch of introduction stuff right here so we can make sure that if we're going to have things for growth and talk about growth, that we're rooted in the word of God. So if I'm going to build a house, Jesus says, don't build up a house if you hadn't counted up the what? Cost. You you don't go to war without first counting up the what? Cost. If you build a house and you don't count up the cost, you might not have enough to what? Finish it. And then he says, how are you going to look on the outside? So what we have to do, we're talking about the spiritual thing. What are we trying to do spiritually? All right. Our foundation must be there. So if I don't want my labor to be in vain, I must first talk to God in prayer. If any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Ask of God who gives to all men liberally. So we pray. So the foundation, the house, this is a building. This is a house. But what we're building is a spiritual building. What we're trying to build upon that foundation, that solid rock is Christ. All right, so here what we're going to do now with this next part, now that we got a foundation that we are to grow, we understand God wants us to grow, and, we're, and God desires I'm going to show you now. I could have put up about 15 more scriptures in here, but I did not. And I put these all up here so you can take notes or just write these down because I'm going to read them because there's several. But the book of Acts, again, this is Bible class stuff. I miss Bible class. <laughs> but we're going to get back in there. Brother John and others, we're all working. We're going to get there. But this is Bible class stuff. The book of Acts really charts the growth of the church. Okay, that's a, that's a theme, and I'm going to show it to you. Look at, look at Luke and the words he uses. And Acts 2.41, and I probably should have made this bigger, but I'll read it out loud. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Were, who's added? Who's doing, who are they being added to? 
the apostles, are they not? They're being added to the apostles. Their names are being added into the Lamb's book of life. They're being added to the church, right, to the number. All right, so you have added and you have 3,000 souls. And this is growth. This is numerical growth. Now, don't take this and, 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 and run the wrong way and think that it's, uh, well, I'll save that point in a second, all right? You'll, you'll see what I mean. Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, what? Add it to the church or to the number daily, such as should be saved. We see growth. Acts 4, verse 4. But many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So we got what? Growth. Let's keep going. And Acts 5, 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So now you have in Acts chapter five more. That's growth. Believers and the believer is one who has heard the gospel, believed it and been baptized. And now they're being added to it. And the Bible says multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So what do we see so far just in chapter five? There's a lot of growth taking place. Well, how does that growth take place? The seed has to be planted in their hearts. Luke 8, 11, And we'll get to that here in a second. All right. Let's continue to go. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was what? Multiplied. There arose a murmur. Now we're talking about the, uh, the widows that are being neglected in the daily administration. But still, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Why is it number becoming multiplied? What are they doing? Are they staying stagnant? Are they telling people? I, I heard this, and Brother, Brother Brad will vouch for this, uh, and, and, and he means well. He didn't say anything bad. He said, if you build it, they shall come. We've heard that many a times. I do not believe that. I do not. I believe you might swell, but I don't believe that's, that, that's not it. There are myriads of places that have been built. In fact, have y'all seen uh, those ghost towns of China? Are y'all familiar with that? They call them ghost towns of China. All right. Uh, nerd alert here. YouTube it. <laughs> but in China, they have these huge cities, skyscrapers upon skyscrapers among skyscrapers, and they're all empty. Huge cities. Huge. I'm not talking about one. I'm talking about 20 or 25 of them at least. And they're absolutely empty. Gorgeous architect. Gorgeous things are right there. So the old adage, if you build it, they will come. No, sir, that's not the case. The commission, what we commonly know as the Great Commission, tells us to do what? Go. Go. That's what it tells us to do. And so I, I've heard it a couple times, and I don't correct or anything like that. But a lot of times, that it is true to a certain extent. I say swell because people will come and they want to see certain things. And it's an opportunity to take advantage of them, to teach them too, no doubt. That is a great opportunity to, to, to teach them and hopefully something can be said to prick their hearts. But the ultimate objective for you and I is to take the gospel message to them. And the reason why they're adding to their numbers and they're being multiplied is because the masses or the, the, or the majority of the Christians are taking the word with them wherever they go. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now you got the religious elite obeying it. Isn't that something? You got religious elite there. So in this book of Acts so far, look at all these passages talking about numbers, more, added, multiplied there. One of the things that I'll say this when I think about growth and I think about this for myself, I'll tell you one of my personal goals. I personally, I, I used to have a personal goal that I want to baptize X amount of people every year. Okay. All right. It was my own personal goal. I want to baptize uh, some people's uh, high is is uh, Mountain Dews. Uh, my rush, my my fix that I need, I need to dunk somebody's body in the water. <laughs> That's what gets me fired up. Okay, it ain't nothing like that. And they come out, and the excitement and the singing that f flows after that. Right? It is. Uh, it's a shot in the arm for me. All right, and for most. Okay, I think sometimes when we talk about subjects like this. We show these things right there, and that's good. 
but we don't necessarily show uh, some of the things that brought it about. Okay. To me, if you fail to plan, you will always fail. If you fail to set a goal, you will always fail. We must first have a goal. And I'm not saying in your mind, I'm talking about written down. Something that you can constantly see over and over again to remind you of it, to keep you focused on it. Does that make sense? So you can hone in on it right there to, uh, so you can do it. So when I, when I think about now, not next year, but just right now, what is our goal collectively? What is our goal individually? What is your goal in regards to t- uh, to trying to communicate the gospel in a day or throughout the week or in a month? If I don't set goals, will we ever achieve anything? Think about it. If you're starting a business and you're in sales, you know you have a quota, right? And But you're not just trying to meet the quota. You're trying to exceed it. But if you don't have a quota, you won't even know where you should land or you won't even have something in which to, to judge by, all right? But anyways... Here's one more point. I'll get back to my text. Sometimes, yes, I have and, and I emphasize I want to baptize so many people, but I've been challenged to look at some things and think about it. Instead of focusing on necessarily how many people have been baptized, how about focusing on how many people I've reached with the gospel? Today, I want to reach eight people with the gospel message. I'm going to make it my goal to reach eight people. How about I say I make it my goal to reach one person with the gospel? If, if in Luke 8, 11, we'll get there in a minute. Again, if the seed is the word of God and my job is to take that seed and plant it there and try to water it, then how many seeds am I going to try to plant today? Many of us have gardens and have gardened before. Well, when you, when you garden, Do you just put out one thing, one seed? You just put out one watermelon. My family, we go through some watermelon or cantaloupe or whatever pretty fast. My girls love tomatoes. They tear them tomatoes up, okay? And they are good. They really are. Fresh tomatoes are great. But anyways, do you just plant one or do you plant a plethora of it? And so the same thing should apply to us. What's my point? When we're talking about growth, I believe it's, it, if we're going to do it, we need to have goals individually and collectively. And we need to constantly be doing the things to achieve those goals so that you can, we can see multiplied, added, and things like that. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. All right. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, They were baptized, both men and women. There it is again, growth. Acts 9, 31. (laughs) Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers, all right? Acts 9, 35. And all who lived at Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. All right, I stopped at chapter 9. But we can go through this book and pretty much on every chapter we can show growth. We can show growth. So we have to have it as a goal, as a focus, constantly at the forefront to do it. All right. As a collective and individual. And many of us do. I'm not saying that we don't. All right. Many of us do. But let's keep it at the forefront. All right. Now, next. We need a heart. If we're going to grow And we're going to have those numbers. It's going to stem from our heart or our mind. And we need a heart for growth or evangelism. All right. Let's turn to Psalm, the 142nd Psalm. All right. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. And believe it or not, I'm almost done. Don't believe that. (laughs) No, I really am. I I got a couple things. Psalm 142. All right, here's David crying out, and he says something in here, and you probably heard me quote this before, but I'm going to apply this in a different term, all right, in a different way. Psalm 142, and we're going to go over the first uh, four or five verses. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Can't you see King David? 
Oh, man. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. And the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. And no man or no one cares for my soul. King David is in despair. He's in a cave. and He's been running. And King David thinks that no man cares for his soul. Is he right? No, he was not right. God had always cared for him. He had other people there that had cared for him. But he got to this point where he felt like no one cared for him. I want us to apply this in regards to the gospel in which we have been entrusted with and evangelism. Can our neighbor or can our friend say, and no man cares for my soul? You saw me without You realize I was a guilty distance. You knew that the scripture said this clearly and I was doing this, but you never said anything. Can our neighbor, can our loved one say, you never cared for my soul? David was wrong with what he said and he said in his distress and the way he felt, he was just talking about the way he felt, but people still cared for him, honestly. But I'm applying this principle to us when it comes to that treasure that we have, the gospel, and being able to teach it. Can someone say about me when they look up in the final roundup of human affairs, you saw me day to day, but you never told me about the way? You see it? So there has to be a heart for evangelism or for growth. Psalm 142, verse 1 through 4. Next, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number two, Philippians chapter number two. Now, notice what David is, where he's in the cave. Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and then the book of Philippians chapter number two. David cries out like this. That's sweet psalmist of Israel. Philippians chapter two. And let's start at verse 18. Philippians chapter two and verse 18. He says, likewise, remember Paul's in prison, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I, too, may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will naturally or genuinely who will be genuinely concerned for your souls, for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. They they all seek their own interests. Paul says, I have no man like-minded who would naturally take care of you or look after you. Timothy loved the souls of other people. King David says, and no man cared for my soul. uh, Compare that with Timothy now on the flip side of the coin. And in in the comparison that's made when when Paul says, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we're so busy seeking after our own interest and and our own affairs and our own issues that we fail to stop and help out that person that's in the road, that 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 person that's needy. We are the Samaritan. We are the Levite. And it's easy to do it. No one sets out and says, today I'm going to be this, 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 and this. But it's always some more convenient time. I'm going to get to this. And I got all these cares weighing me down. And at some point, me, you, and all of us have to stop and say, I'm going to do this and make it a point. If we're not making it a calculated point or a goal, then it won't happen. And notice what he says at verse 20. They all seek their own interests. You know, my own interests might not necessarily be bad, but it's not always the best choice. All right. Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. I am. All right. So we need a heart for growth and evangelism. All right. A heart for growth and evangelism. And John chapter 13, John chapter 13. All right, this love, this love right here. John always is talking about love, all right? This right here. Sometimes we have our own interest, but we got to make sure we have love. 
John chapter 13, verse 34. Once I start to read it, you'll all know where it's at. You'll all say, yep, that's right. A new commandment I give to you that you what? Love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Well, let's slow down. When you think about loving and the Jesus example of love, he took them, he trained them, he taught them, and then he commissioned them. And then when they missed the mark and when they stumbled, he was there to nurture them and, and to bring them back. When they would do some vile things to them, he ultimately would die on the, on the cross for their sins and ours, and he would still use them. All right. That's the love that he has that that must be uh, 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 reciprocated amongst us. The next verse says. By this, all men or all people will know that you are my disciples. If predicated upon contingency, you have love for one another. All right. And so the world is going to take note of our love. The world is going to take note that we're looking out for them and we're concerned about their spiritual welfare. They see the bond and the closeness that we have and they want to know more about it. But see, you can't fake that. You're either genuinely concerned about someone's welfare or you're not. Right. There's no two faking that. I know, you know, and, 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 and it's it, we have a very loving congregation. All right. We need a heart for growth and for evangelism. All right. Last part, we need a plan for growth. I put these passages up here, all right? Luke 4, 16. This is Jesus in the context of Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. He had a custom. It has to become a habit for us to try to reach lost souls. It has to become a a habit for us to make our prayers. Lord, can you put me in the path of those that are seeking to know more about you? That has to be our custom. That has to be our habit of prayer. Colossians chapter four, Paul prayed for a door of opportunity that he may speak, that he may speak the gospel and that he may proclaim it. And the Lord would help him with that. Acts 17, verse 1. Now, when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. This is Paul, all right? Verse 2. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So we see Jesus had a custom of doing certain things. Paul had a custom of doing certain things. We have to have a custom. We, it has to become a habit. It really needs to become subconscious where we do it automatically, where we're trying to uh, uh, offer someone grace, salvation, hope, right? Share love with them. And the most familiar passage for a plan of growth is Acts 1.8. You receive power when when you receive uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even into the remotest parts of the earth. When 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 God commissioned the gospel to go into all the worlds, he purposely planned it out on which to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. How do you know that? You remember when Paul wants to go over here, but the Holy Spirit forbade him. Y'all remember that? And then he gets this call, this vision, come over to Macedonia and help us, we pray. You remember that? He wanted to go here. God had had other plans for him where to go. God is directing this thing. So what am I saying? Individually, I need to have a plan of action. How am I going to spend my day to day? And what way am I going to try to be evangelistic individually? Then collectively, as men, and we're working on it, we have certain things, and prayerfully in the, in the coming uh, year and, and even implement things now, we can have a plan and everybody puts in and, and chips in. Finding this person's strength and where they're strong at and using them in that particular regard. Does that make sense? That's what we're trying to do. So you have to have a plan for growth, all right? Remember, what are we trying to do? We did not read it. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 says the seed is the word of God. We are trying to take the word of God, the seed, and plant it so that that seed can produce much fruit. 
because in this my father is well pleased in that you bear much fruit. Right. So growth, growth, and no matter what you do from spiritual to the carnal, you have to plan it out. You have to work at it. It has it's a methodical thing. Um, I'll, I'll say this last illustration. And I'll, I'll sit down. I'll make a secular example. But if you are um, uh, training, they have very strict regimens, right, that they do. They eat very um, lean. Like if you're you watch a, 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 a tennis player get ready or you watch a, a, a ball player or something like that, they have a very strict regimen. Or a boxer would do certain things prior to the day and, and all those things. And they're very regimented about it and they're very structured because they're trying to reach this end goal, and that is the victory. And so the same thing that works over there really is based off the scriptures anyways. It's a methodical plan in which we must execute. Remember, he says, my people perish for a lack of what? Knowledge, right? But he also says where there is no vision, there is no vision, all right? So you have to have a plan, a vision, in a way in which we are to do it. And I believe going forward, we have various things, and going forward, we're going to try to do it, and we're asking everyone to participate. And so what I'm trying to get us to do, myself, first and foremost, to look at myself, what, what can I do better? What can I do more? All right? And I believe that's all our mindset. I believe ultimately all of us, and which is the ultimate goal, We're here. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thank you for your kind time and attention. I hope, trust, and pray I've said something to encourage you, something to edify you. We'll talk about this a little bit more the next time. I have a couple other things in which I did not touch, but we'll get to that on the next time if the Lord says the same. The gospel message, beloved, you've heard it many times. It's simple. You believe that Christ came into this world lived a sinless life, died on the cross to atone for our sins, was buried in the earth, and resurrected from that grave never to die again. That he is the Son of God. You believe that. And then, by that same belief, you are buried with him in a watery grave of baptism, believing that when I am am becoming dead to sin, and I'm a new creation in Christ, and that I too will resurrect one day. And so shall we ever be with him. All right. That same spirit of the dead, Romans six, that, that, that we, we too will resurrect from that grave. Say he comes first, that we have that confident expectation of there is more to life than this. And we will spend eternity with him. So we need the president of the church. You want to put the Lord on in baptism for remission of your sins, whatever way.